Hi, I'm Katie, and this is episode 67 of Ornamentations, which I think is going to be a great one because I have so much to share with you today. I have lots of progress on my different projects. I have some FFOs to share with you, as well as a surprise start. You might be able to guess if you've been watching me for a while what I have just been itching to start. I also have some wonderful progress on the Bread and Mart sampler to share with you. I'm just so pleased about how this is turning out, as well as the giveaway winner from the previous episode and a special new giveaway to share with you today. I also have just a little bit of haul. But first of all, I would like to thank you all for the absolutely wonderful response to this happy morning, which was just a smash success. Thank you so much, whether you bought a kit or you just listened to me ramble about how much I love those greens and reds and those fabulous silks. So truly, thank you. Your support makes so many things possible, and I really do appreciate it. But let's get to my stitching, and today we'll start with one of my ongoing whips, now an FFO, and that's Parson Brown by Not Forgotten Farm, which I have been stitching on Legacy Linen 37 Count Smoke Signal as a companion piece to my finish of Heartstring Samplery Baby It's Cold Outside. So that's now FFO'd, and I think these just work so well together. Look at that, the smoke signal and the cloister cream, which are the two linens here, just set each off other set each other off beautifully. And I think the charts really work together as a companion display. I didn't quite get these standing up straight, but you know, this just to give you an idea. But let's look specifically at Parson Brown. So he's actually very sparkly because of the bijou copper leaf that I used for the border, but that never shows up on camera. What I think you can see though is the sequins that I added just to accent the snowman just a little bit. And these are a little different from the ones I usually like to use on my cross stitch. So like beads, sequins come in a variety of finishes and I most often use a clear gloss so that's with no applied finish as I did for the roof on the house for baby it's cold outside because that um, is just kind of a gentle enhancement it's not too strong it doesn't detract from your stitching it's a really great easy way to just put a little subtle sparkle on but for this, because he's quite tonal, which I love, but I thought that left a little room for a little bolder look with the sequins. So this is an opaque white with an AB finish. And if you're not familiar with the different types of finishes, you might want to check out my beaded spiral rope trim tutorial because the first half of that is actually a discussion about beads, crystals, um, their different types, finishes, sizes, etc. And a lot of that also applies to the different kinds of things you can find in sequins. So these were purchased from a needlepoint store in my area that has since closed, but a friend recommended a source online, Bedecked and Bedazzled, which I'll link in the description where you should be able to find some good sequins that are needlework sized, which is why I recommend a needlepoint source if you don't have one in your area. I know many people don't. So, Barson Brown, I absolutely love him. For the back, I use this absolutely beautiful little remnant of brown silk satin that I had in stash. I always love it when I can take some odd sized scrap and actually do something with it. Just waste not, want not, right? And some of you might actually recognize this. The reason I had an odd sized scrap was because I had bought this to use for the suit, which is the same silk satin, it's just been appliqued over a padded figure on Damon the Mower, who was um, one of the figures on the doors of my Stemfork mirror, as seen on my notebooks. So that's the same fabric used in my Stemfork embroidery. 
And then this is the odd side re <laughs> sized remnant of what I had cut to experiment with that technique used as, oh, the perfect complimentary finish for my cross stitch. So I love it. This was purchased in person from Brightex. I don't have a link for that. Unfortunately, a lot of my stash was just stuff that I've picked up from fabric stores over the years, but that's Parson Brown. I'm so pleased with them. I love how these two pair together. If I can get them to stand up straight. No, not quite. I'll have to pin them in place when I actually go to display them next Christmas. But, oh, love it. And I really enjoyed trying out the AB finish and seeing how that and the opaque, opaque sequins really changed the look. It wouldn't work for everything. I think, you know, like a clear gloss is a, something where it's really hard to go wrong. But for something where you want a little more jazz, that's a great option. And then my next FFO is something that you saw the stitching finish last time, but I haven't FFO'd it yet. And that's the Christmas in July Floss 2 kit, Stacy Nash, Wonderful Life, Pinky Drum. Oh, the conversions for um, both of the pieces I just showed you have been published, but I'll put them again in the description for today's episode. So, Stacey Nash, Wonderful Lake, Pain Keep Drop. So I've done the FFO, but I haven't done the display yet. One of the things that really drew me to this piece was the beautiful way Stacey Nash has that displayed on the stand with the greenery. I have an idea for a little Katie twist on that, which I'm going to experiment with, and I hope I'll be able to show you a displayed finish soon. But this is my finished drum, and I have to change the pin. I have a set of beautiful pearl-headed pins somewhere. I just wasn't able to dig them up in time. So I used Vonna Pfeiffer's drum finishing tutorial, which is wonderful. I'll link it in the description for today's episode. And I just love, oh, you know, so the red gives it so much jazz but the rust is really very tonal. It, the colors just all enhance each other. And then the choice of the soft gray linen for the soft gray satin for the top, I think just enhances all the other color choices in this drum. And then I added a silk ribbon and kind of a taupey gray. The ribbon won't be included in the kit because I think there are just so many ways you can go with that. I will include in the kit materials what I bought and where if you would like to do the same thing on yours, but I will definitely include the silk satin because I think that's so much a part of the finish. Actually, I've already bought it. It's on its way. It should be here tomorrow and then I will start cutting it up for kits. But that is a first look at my finish of Stacey Nash's Wonderful Life Pink Keep Drum. And I hope to be showing you a fully jazzed up display for too long. We'll see when I have the chance to really sit down with my ideas and try and bring them to life. It's going to look very similar to what Stacey Nash has done, just maybe a little sparkle fly. So we'll see this again. and. As I said, it's going to be the Christmas in July kit, but oh, I just got, I could not be more pleased with this. It's always wonderful when the finish matches the vision you had in your head for how the piece could look. And oh, these colors, sparkly silver snowflakes. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. So. Oh, really, really, really happy with this. So we'll see when I'll be showing you the displayed finish, but this is my FFO, which I'm really, really pleased with. And I hope you guys are excited too because Christmas in July kit. And then oh, next, let's talk about my surprise start. So as some of you may have heard, California has been getting walloped by atmospheric rivers and let's see, not this previous weekend, but the weekend before. Oh, it was cold and dark and rainy and damp. And I just didn't want to stitch on any of my regular projects. I wanted to do something fun with some bright colors that 
you know, wasn't anything that I guess I needed to do. So it would be good if I actually brought this over here. So I have a surprise start, which is Fox and Rabbit's Elizabeth Campbell 1838, which was one of their releases from Needlework Expo. I saw the model in person at summer school where Karen was stitching on it. And it really, really struck me. Um, do you know when you can remember the first time you saw a piece because it left such a strong impression on you. I mean, I can actually remember sitting around the table with Karen and Bran, looking at what Karen's stitching was and going, oh, what is that? This piece left a really strong impression on me. So I have been dying to start it really ever since they released the chart. But it's been so busy, I've been trying to focus on AKGOT. I was being a very responsible, good girl. However, last weekend I just threw all that to the winds and went for a start on Elizabeth Campbell. And since the 48 count Legacy Linen, this is March Pain, is now out and I've been dying to try the 48 count, I threw aside the 5363 Sicilian Marzipan I had already cut. Don't worry, I'll find another use for this. I love this linen. And decided to go for the dual fun of getting to start Elizabeth Campbell and then getting to try the 48 count, which I have been absolutely dying to do. So I started with the center fountain and the birds because that really vibrant high contrast black and red is not really my usual kind of thing. I like samplers with lots of pink flowers and florals and you know you, you know what I mean. So these this kind of bolder high contrast look isn't what I would normally choose for myself, but I was just so struck by the piece when I saw it that, oh, I had to stitch it. And so that's where I started because this, that the fountain with the birds, I think is what really drew me to that finish. So I wanted to base my conversion around that element. That's why I started where I did. Getting that red right was really critical for me. I also chose a second red for the strawberries in the border and I wanted to bring those a little closer than they were in um, the model. They've got a little more of a burgundy and I wanted the reds to just be a little closer in shade. I am doing my own silk conversion for this. This is obviously nowhere near complete, but oh, oh, I love it. I'll share the four colors <laughs> that I have already, but it'll probably be a while until I can really spend some serious time with this because I do want to get back to AKGIT. I've gotten so far on that. I'd like to see it hanging on my wall. But anyways, as you can see from the fountain, I traveled down to the border because Elizabeth Campbell is a pretty heavy border relative to the interior stitching. So you don't want to leave that all for the end. So I want to try and chip away at the border when I can find some time for this. And um, so that's where I went next. So the major change which I plan on making here, obviously I am tweaking the colors a little bit. I've added a second green to the border instead of the called for peach that's used there. The big change is going to be up there because as I've mentioned before, I would like to make this a uh, heritage sampler for my father's side. Funny story, when I was stitching this happy morning, which as if you've heard was a heritage piece for my mother's side, I was sitting next to my mother, we were stitching together one day, we were discussing the changes and you know the family members I was putting on it and my dad looked up from his reading and said, where am I on this? And my mother and I just both looked at him like, you pay attention to our stitching? And then my mother somewhat indignantly said, I'm sorry, is this your family farm? No, but it gave me the idea of doing a heritage sampler for 
that side of the family because apparently my dad wanted to be on one of them. Who knew? Don't worry, mom, dad, I'm not gonna give this to dad for Christmas. It'll stay on my shelves. I don't think he actually wants a sampler in his possession. He just wants to be included. But, <laughs> okay, sorry, I don't even know where I was. Side story, that was not relevant. Oh, so I'm going to replace the alphabet and then Elizabeth Campbell and the date with family initials representing that side of the family. Originally, I had thought that I would just use the existing alphabet and then put crowns on top of it, as you sometimes see on Scottish samplers, but I think that might look a little unbalanced. Sorry had to sneeze. Spring is not that far away here in Northern California and with that there is lots of pollen in the air. Anyways, where was I? Initials. Um, so I think the family initials might look a little unbalanced within the crowned configuration because there's a visual imbalance between my father and I who both had the standard first, middle, last and my grandparents who had a lot of initials. I mean, ridiculous amounts. Respectively, they were R-S-A-G-S -S and K-V-J-T-S. So yeah, I think that might look better just as groups of letters. Also, I'm really dying to try out some of the fancy curlicued letters from Tirchi and Girchi from Modern Folk Embroidery, which are very similar to letters that later migrated into Scottish samplers. So I think that would still fit stylistically. However, this is all a very long way away, so it's a pretty academic discussion at this point. Um, as I said, I really do want to return to AKGIT. So I am sadly probably going to put Elizabeth Campbell away for a while. Got it in my summer school bag where I saw Karen stitching the model, but we'll see if I can find more time to work on it. But that's Fox and Rabbit Elizabeth Campbell on the Legacy Linen 48 Count March Pain, and that's with Suasafine. I know a lot of people have been using 103 on the 48 Count, but I like Surfine for it. It looks fabulous, really sharp, defined crosses. And then next whip. So, as you've heard, Laura and I are doing a 12 by 12, one ornament for every month, and because I took a detour with Elizabeth Campbell. I'm a little behind on our February stitch. That's Holly Jolly by Not Forgotten Farm. Laura also, you know, followed some squirrels. So my thought was that since I already have a February finish, which I showed you last episode, if you missed it, I'm going to slow walk this into March and then Holly Jolly will be my March finish. However, I do have a complete conversion, which I will share in this episode. I am reducing the colors just a little bit. So the snowman is not going to be wearing a gray sweater shirt thing. He's just going to be all snow. And then this is Swasophene on Legacy Linen 5363 Sandcastle. Oh, I think it's gonna look great. It's so fabulously tiny. I love it. There's not much to do on this, but it, you know, pushing it into March. I made an executive decision and that's fine. I do hope to have a finish for you next time to share though, because really, not that much more to do on this guy. He's pretty close. So looks great. Love it. And then the next piece I have to show you is something that I started quite a while ago, established the conversion and then put away. That's Plum Street Samplers. Oops, stuff over here. I've got things all over the place for today's episode. Lots of stuff to talk about. That's a good thing though. 
and that's Plum Street's Chocolate Hearts. So this, along with the first of the Tiny Treasures, which you haven't seen that one yet, is going to be the late spring, early summer floss tube kits. Don't have an ETA on those releases. I don't have the thread yet. I do have the linen though, and I get to spend a lot of time cutting that up soon. That's gonna be fun. And so Chocolate Hearts, oh, I think this is a sleeper pattern. I I don't know if I've seen this one stitched, at least on floss tube, and oh, I love it. As I told you when I first showed this, it really reminds me of the 17th century, which as you know is my home in embroidery, so I'm understandably very drawn to it, and I decided to pick this back up because I have a finishing dilemma on this, and I want to get working on the finishing, which means finishing the stitching first. So, ooh, it's really washing out. Sorry, it's overcast today. We had a beautiful, warm, sunny weekend, and then, yeah, I think rain's coming in. So colors are looking a little weird in here today, but I am over halfway at this point. I've been chunking out the grass, which is definitely some block sticking all, stitching, although it's not nearly in the category of dang grass, such as in this happy morning, which, ooh, that was a lot of block stitching. But, oh, it's beautiful. I love this piece. And then, these are the threads. There's just eight spools. Okay, I'm not gonna drop them all over the floor, so. Eight spools. And I am going to make the hearts symmetrical so they'll both be that dark brown, although there is a lighter brown included in the kit if you'd like to do it just like the chart. So my idea was also to put this in the top of a shaker box like Paulette did and make this into a really beautiful sewing box. Don't you think that would be so pretty? The colors make me think of late spring or early summer, but it's not necessarily a seasonal piece. I think it'd be a beautiful, beautiful sewing box. So I squirreled off. I found a round, be oh, gorgeous cherry shaker box from Suffolk Shaker Shop and then realized kind of belatedly that because it has to accommodate the wrapping on the sides, it's not perfectly round. That's the kind of thing that makes me twitchy if I'm looking at embroidery stuffed into it. So I'm hoping that since this isn't a perfectly symmetrical piece, especially along the top, that that won't bother me. It might though. So what I think I'm going to do is I am going to, once I finish it, put this on a temporary mount so that I can unlace it and go back if I don't like it. See how it looks. It's this that really makes me twitchy. You know, it's a handmade piece. This is the style. I just didn't really think about it before I purchased it. See how it looks and then if the not circularness is really twitching me. I do have several other ideas on finishing for this. One would be that, uh, so this comes out to just about a perfect seven inch round when finished according to my measurements. And that's a standard box size. So you can get a paper mache box from Michael's. Those are super cheap. There are also these um, beechwood kind of shakery style boxes that can be painted or finished. I mean, if I were strictly thinking about sales, I would paint this red and mount it on the top. That would look banging. I'm not really a red person, so I could paint it green now. I love green. And that is actually truly circular. So that's another possibility. I do really like the idea of doing this as a sewing box. That calls to me. The other thing is this could be a round hanging like I've done with my ribbon edge ornament finishes. I'm gonna try and remember to insert a photo here of a slightly larger one I did for my mom, not as big as this. Seven inches is a pretty large hanging, but I found some different grogain ribbons that I think coordinate with the colors of this piece. Ooh, that looks really pretty. 
more topies. Also nice. Fabulous red. Anyone for red? So one thing I will do with the kits is I will put all of these options and sources in the kit materials so you will have a lot of choice as to how you have to finish your own. I know around it requires a little more imagination, but honestly on this piece, I think it's totally worth it. It is beautiful. And the other option that I've kind of been playing with would be a drum with a stitched top. So this was last year's Summer Floss Tube Kit, Stacey Nash's Big Blue House Pinky Drum. This one does have stitching on the sides, but the primary attraction is the stitched top. So you could make this into a drum where the top is stitched and then you just put like a beautiful floral or a plain satin or just something lovely on the sides to set it off. So lots of possibilities here. We'll see where I come out on this one. I haven't quite decided myself. My first choice is still the shaker box, but we'll see how I like that once it's actually done. So. I hope to smash through the rest of that grass and then yeah, we'll see how much further I get on this before the next episode. There's not a ton of stitching in this. It's detailed oh, and I love that about it, but it's not anything crazy. So that is Plum Street Chocolate Hearts and now I'm going to move a couple things away and then we'll talk about haul. Okay, let's talk haul. I don't have a ton of it, but it's pretty good. So I ordered the six new colors of 103. It's just a lot of possibilities for spring stitching, right? This color in particular, I think is just such a winner. That is 539. And if you like these, the attic has them all in stock, so you can give them a call and ask for the new 103 colors. And then I also, ordered some fabulous new tools. They are not here yet, so I'll be showing them to you on the next episode. They have already shipped. But if you watch Susan Stanley's most recent floss tube, and if you haven't, what are you thinking? Please go watch her most recent floss tube, which I will link in the description. But she has had these fabulous new shears made. Oh, they're engraved on the blades. It just Oh, I, I, I died when she showed them. I hit pause on our video. I squirreled over to her website. I ordered them right away. And then I returned to her floss tube and realized slightly belatedly that they are right-handed shears and I am left-handed. So they might have to be a gift for a right-handed stitcher of my acquaintance. However, I'm really going to enjoy looking at them and petting them when they arrive and showing them on my floss tube. I am a real sucker for scissors of all kinds, not just <laughs> embroidery scissors. I do maintain a full collection of shears. I have three pairs in active use for different kinds of fibers, as Susan recommends. It's a really good habit to get into if you're cutting different kinds of fibers regularly. It'll help you keep all of your blades in their best condition. I do actually have a first stitches story for you today relating to scissors, inspired by Susan's floss too. So when I was growing up, as I've told you, I learned to sew, taught by my mother from a very young age, and my childhood was seemingly divided between her sewing room and reading books up a tree. You know, that's just me in a nutshell. Stitching and reading, stitching and reading. Anyways, in her sewing room, she also had multiple pairs of shears for different uses. And there was one pair that I was rarely allowed to touch and only under close supervision. Those were her best shears. And then when I had my first adult apartment, you know, it was big enough to store things in. I didn't have any idiot roommates who might damage good stuff. She gave me three practical gifts to mark my coming of age adulthood. And the third gift was her best pair of scissors, her best shears, which have, oh, 
to this day, they are my favorite pair and they've been designated for linen because that's what I cut the most of. And yeah, so first stitches in that I remember these from a oh, very, very early age in our sewing tray and also marking my first steps as an adult. So there's a lot of memory invested in this particular pair of shears. It's funny how objects can hold so much meaning for us. So these are really special to me, not only because they're my favorite scissors, but because they were, you know, my mom gave up her favorite pair of scissors to give to me. And the last time I showed these, I was asked what they were. They are a pair of Zwilling Henkels. However, they're over 30 years old and um, they don't make this exact style anymore, which is a real shame because it's quite lightweight and to my mind better than the shears they are making these days. So that's my first stitches story for you. Lots of story time today. I guess I'm feeling extra chatty. Sorry about that. Hope it's not boring. And then the last piece I have, piece of haul I have for you relates to the Proto Mart sampler. So this is my segue into that. I ordered and received a Millennium frame and that was such a relief because I had been working on a scroll frame. I was not finding the tension adequate. You can improve the tension on a scroll frame by lacing the sides, but there were some practical difficulties in doing that on this pro um, project, mainly the way I'm going to be moving in between bands and that I mostly take it off the frame to show you for floss too. I don't want to release it every time. What a bore. However, really liking the Millennium Frame. The biggest drawback to it is that it's not a good fit with my Lowry floor stand and I am wedded to my Lowry floor stand, which I love. However, I'm making it work for this. So the Millennium Frame will never replace this late frame for me, but for this project, it's been a boon. And this is my progress on the Brittle Mart Sampler. So Oh, we're starting to see some real length there. That is, it's coming along. So this is band four. There will be a total of six floral bands followed by verse and name at the bottom. So this is some excellent progress and oh, I love this band. So the blue balls here with the curly cues, I don't actually know what to call them. Those are actually going to be filled with needle lace eventually but the needle lace is going to go in last. I don't want that to get crushed by rolling on the bars here. So I'm going to stitch the full length of the sampler and then I'm going to go back in and add the needle lace elements when that's the absolute last thing so that the needle lace can't get damaged. This is actually most of the fourth band. So what it still needs here are, there are flanking roses on either side of the tulip skin needs the border at the top and then there are some filler elements that go in to just kind of fill out the space of the band but oh my god I love look at how that satin stitch just gleams and glows the rich pink against the green oh I absolutely love it so the fourth and the fifth bands in my opinion are really the showstopper ones on the sampler. I mean I love them all. I picked them because I love them and I think they work together to make a cohesive sampler but we're getting to the really good stuff here so I can't wait to show you my continuing progress. I'm really hoping that I'll have a finish on the fourth band to show you next time and maybe a start on the fifth band and then the back. So yeah. Oh, reversible stitching is really growing on me. So at first I was just like, oh, it's necessary, but it's so slow. I don't think I'm ever going to do this again. However, I am a sucker for a big dramatic reveal and oh man, is it awesome to show the front. And show the back. Oh, oh, it looks awesome. Yeah, really growing on me. 
Also, I think I'm getting better at it as I move down the sampler and just get a little more comfortable with all of the things. I am going to go back and tweak a few things on the earlier bands just to better alter the balance of colors here, but I'm not going to make any changes until the dark green Paris comes in and I can fill in those elements so as we've discussed the leaves that are missing because that's really going to alter the balance of colors on this and I want to make sure that I'm seeing everything when I make those decisions. It would just be the absolute worst to have the color balance altered and realize that you had it right in the first place. No, I think you're actually seeing the gleam of the silk a little better today. Maybe it's something about it being overcast, but oh yeah, look at that. So one of the really magical things about this sampler is that crazy shine that you get from the filament silk in this application. So you see it more in satin stitch than you do in just regular cross. And this is here in here, the first appearance of reversible cross on the sampler. So yeah, front, back. Reversible Cross, very aptly named. So that is my progress on the Bernamart sampler. Oh, I love it. I'm gonna wave it around just a little bit more so you can think, see some of that shine. Ooh, it's good in here today. I'm very pleased with that. It's normally so hard to show. Oh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I'm. I'm so pleased and I cannot wait to show you more of the Bretton Mart sampler as it continues to evolve. So I thought we'd close before I get to the giveaways at the very end with a quick discussion on the historic use of frames with band samplers. So I have talked about the need for tension on the Bretton Mart sampler and there are a lot of different ways you can get that. You don't have to have a Millennium frame to work the Bretton Mart sampler. I will detail different options. But it's not just a modern convenience. It's actually the historically accurate way to work. So this is before schoolgirls start using hoops for their samplers. 17th century band samplers were actually worked on frame setups because you needed the use of two hands. It's actually quite useful working it today, but it was necessary for them partly from the stitches, but also because of the thread they were using. We're using twisted filament silk for the Bretton Mart sampler because it gives a similar look, but it's much easier. They were using untwisted filament silk, which requires the use of a lane tool, which very much necessitates the use of both hands, therefore a frame. So I ended up talking to a friend about this who's much more of an expert in this area than I am, and she pointed me to a couple references, thankfully in books I already had, about the historic use of frames during this period, both professional and amateur. So the first reference is from a book called by Janet Arnold called Queen Elizabeth's Wardrobe Unlocked, and this is a deep dive into the records of Queen Elizabeth's wardrobe and what those records tell us about it. And there's a reference in here to the use of frames in the Queen's embroidery. So in 1566, she has a new gown made and the invoice is itemized and one of the items on the invoice is the cost of setting the embroidery in the frame, billed at 10 shillings for the labor required. And so they called it setting in the frames in the warrants and they were often using something called a tenter frame. And those were also used by amateurs. As you can see, this is an illustration from 1613. It shows three women who are very definitely not professional embroiderers. These are ladies of leisure, as is evidenced by their clothing, and they are at work in the garden. So you've got two ladies who are doing lace making on lace pillows. That's what's depicted there. And then in the center, you have a lady working embroidery 
on a tenter frame. Look at the shape. A lot like what you might have used for a band sampler, for example. So perhaps that's something she had from her education. Or it was just what was most suited to the embroidery that she's working on. So we do have contemporary evidence for their use by amateurs as well as professionals. A frame was already the standard for professional embroiderers, but the kinds of stitches and the thread they were using meant that you see schoolgirls and amateurs and home embroiderers using frames as well. So, um, oh, I also wanted to just direct your attention quickly to another book that I have talked about on here before, but I can't recommend highly enough, and that's Sampled Lives. Samplers from the Fitzwilliam Museum by Carol Humphrey, and this is a great resource on band samplers, but also on the evolution of samplers more generally. Carol Humphrey is a titan in the field, and she does a great job of placing the sampler in a context, you know, how it evolves over time. The Fitzwilliam has a really significant collection of band samplers, so that does take up a lot of space in this book. Hold on. Oh, fabulousness. As you can see from all my marks, this is something I use and refer to pretty regularly. But um, she does a wonderful job of placing the sampler in context the evolution of the form from the earliest band and spot samplers to the things you see in the 18th century and beyond. This is also still in print, <laughs> so please get your copy before it goes out of print and prices soar on the secondary market, as tends to happen with needlework books. So. Speaking of frames, that is my giveaway for today. The arrival of my Millennium frame means that I don't need the scroll frame I was working with. This is a Hayes Creations Perfect Tension frame. That's a misnomer. It's basically a regular scroll frame and has the tension that you would get with any scroll frame setup. But I bought two sets of bars for it set aside and for some reason I don't really know why I also have an extra set of knobs. So the whole setup which you could use for the Britomart sampler but anyone's eligible to enter. If you're in the US please just the cost of international shipping has soared so I'm going to ask for US only entries on this one. You could definitely use it for the Britomart sampler. You would want to lace the sides as I said. Um, if you were using it for that purpose, but also if you need a frame, I would like to pass this on to a stitcher who needs one because I'll be using my Millennium frame for future band samplers and for embroidery. Like I said I'm pretty wedded to my slate frames, so I'd like to pass that setup on to a stitcher who would like one. And the keyword for that is frame. And then I also have the winner of the giveaway from the last episode, which is the chart for This Happy Morning by Plum Street Samplers. And the winner for that is Stitching Epiphanies. I've commented on your comment. Please contact me using the form on my website with your mailing address, and I will get this in the mail to you. Congratulations. So for next time, I am hoping that I will have my haul from market. If not, we'll look at it in the following episode. As I said, I've been pretty restrained, but I did buy a few things and I'll share my market picks with you. And then I hope I can convince my mom to come on for a guest appearance. Next time or the time after that, we'll see. And then we'll have continuing progress on Brita Mart Sampler, as well as my other whips, and the triumphant return of AKGIT. I am getting back to that. I want to finish that this year. I want to see it hanging on my wall. So it's AKGIT time, and we'll be seeing it here on the channel for the first time since I think November. It's been put away for a while. So I'll see you again in two weeks, and until then, 
happy stitching.